I picking myself up from here? Am I picking myself up from here? So welcome back to this week's paper review. Today's paper review is something that fits what we should do for the International Women's Day, and that is a female focused paper review because sometimes it gets lost in literature. We've done ones before that have been done on female subjects, but not particularly focused on any unique characteristics. paper is coming at us from Slovakia. It is the acute performance enhancement following squats combined with elastic bands on short sprint and vertical jump height in female athletes. So the reason we picked this paper today was it's a it's a PAP paper PAP or as they call it in this paper PAPE. Uh, for some reason they changed the terminology I don't know why. So basically what it's looking at is traditional PAP versus PAP that use band resisted squats with two different loading protocols to see if it had any effect on the outcome of PAP. So what we had was we had 14 female athletes of a pretty high quality, judging by their ability to squat and the sports they're involved in. So we had a range of volleyball players. We actually had some CrossFit athletes, track and field, and handball athletes involved in the group. All of them are squatting at least are almost to double body weight. The weights range from 120 kilos to somewhere in the region of like 112. So that very, very talented female athletes, possibly squatting more than some of the viewers, just saying. So we should just, you know, if that's an issue, get the rotating your squat program. But anyway, so these athletes were very, very talented. We had a, a reasonable number of them for the subject or for the testing. So what they were looking at was after the PAP protocols or post-activation potentiation, was they were looking at their five, three, five and 10 meter sprint time, their squat jump height, and then their counter movement jump height. So what they had was they split the athletes into four different groups. So we had just a normal PAP group without the elastic bands. Then we had a group which was loaded to 85% of their 1RM for three sets of four. And then they loaded this with at least 20% of that loaded with bands. They had a second group of with using bands, same load again, 85%, but at least 30% of the load was facilitated using elastic bands. And then finally with a controlled group, which did the testing, but didn't do any actual squatting. They did just five minutes of passive walking to you know, facilitate some kind of exercise, but not do actually any squatting and see what the results were on this. So all groups, so all the subjects went through each group to get some kind of uniform results and see if there was any discrepancy between these. What they did basically was they got their 1RMs first, they got baseline testing for their sprint times and their squat jump and counter movement jump. And then the protocols were three by four at whatever group they were in, in the squat, or if they weren't squat, if they're in the control group. And then after five and 10 minutes, they enacted whatever physical activity they were doing, which whether it was the sprinting or the jumping, and then the results were recorded. On to the results then next. So the first results we're going to look at are the sprint results, right? So they looked at three meter sprint times and five meter sprint times. There were significant time by interaction uh, findings for the three meter sprint. The band 30 group, which is basically the squats with 30% of the loading coming from bands, were the only group found to have significant improvements for the 5-minute post and 10-minute post. So basically, you go do your squats with 30% of the weight being banded, then you go 5 minutes afterwards and test your sprint, or 10 minutes afterwards and test your sprint. The group that only improved in both of those was the band 30 group. Similar findings then for the 5-meter sprint, and... What we found was like there was a significant improvement for the isometric group for the post five minutes for the five meter sprint. But same again, band 30 group here is five minutes post and 10 minutes post. They're having significant improvements, whereas we're not seeing that so much with the other groups. So post hoc analysis next. And that's when you look at like the difference between uh, was one intervention better than the other was one intervention better than control, right? There's significant difference found here for a difference between band 20. So I talked about band 30 earlier. Band 20 is just squats with 20% of the loading coming from bands. So there's significant difference found there between that and the control group. So basically the control group who did nothing, they were found to have significantly worse effects than the banded 20 group. The jumps then are the next thing today is counter movement jumps and squat jumps. There's interesting findings here in the fact that like all PAPE or what we usually refer to as PAP, right? Post-activation potentiation. They're calling a post-activation performance enhancement here. All groups improved. So all groups that had like band 20, band 30, whatever it was, isometric, all of those groups improved and they all improved significantly when when compared to the control. On to the discussion next. 
And there's two main points I want to talk about in the discussion. The first point is like the studying of female athlete groups and like really, really rigorously controlled uh, randomized control trials like you see here, right? So when you're looking at the literature and we actually just came across this issue this morning that a huge amount of studies and a huge amount of the kind of larger hitting studies in, especially in sport and exercise science, tend to be with male athlete groups, right? There's a few reasons for that. Uh, one of the reasons is there's just larger population groups. So if you're in a university setting and you're looking at the proportion of males playing sport or males actively training the females, it is skewed in the direction of males, right? But it's unbelievably important that we get high quality studies such as this done in female athlete groups. So there are huge differences in terms of physiology and psychology and reaction to training and adaptation from training. So when we look at a group like this and we look at the caliber of the athletes, like Owen mentioned one thing there of like the the relative weight of, of back squats to body weight being very, very high, right? These athletes in this study in particular are like very, very high level athletes. And that's something we don't often get to see in female training studies. A lot of the studies we get to see in females tend to uh, revolve around like very specified areas. So areas such as female athlete triad syndrome, areas such as the reoccurrence of ACL tears after previous injury. Um, they're, they're kind of specialist areas that researchers deem to be kind of like, okay, we need to go and study this. In fact, we need to be going and studying all the major uh, factors we look at in strength and performance. We need to be doing studies like this on PAP. We need to be doing studies on hypertrophy. All of these things, running them with high-level female athletes and seeing what our outcomes are. Because it's definitely a shortcoming in the literature uh, and it's not just in recent years. Like, if anything, in recent years, it's been getting better. But it's definitely a kind of large gaping hole in the current research or in the current bank of research. The second thing then is like the the differences, right? So anybody who's coached female athletes, programmed female athletes will understand there are certain differences. In different sports, those differences are larger or smaller. Training intensity, training frequency, the frequency at which they can go above certain intensities is quite different. And that's why these studies are so important. So if you have a female weightlifter, for example, and you're wondering... Will box jumps be a good training intervention if I want to increase speed? If I want to, should I use pros to activation potentiation in a female sprinter? A lot of the studies you look at previously would be looking at male sprinters and seeing if it works for male sprinters. Whereas when we look at other research topics, looking at the difference between male and female athletes, and you start seeing, okay, the total training volume across the week is different. The level of progression of, true training volume over the course of a cycle is different so we really do need to be a small bit more keyed in and a small bit more understanding that there are certain differences here so one of the reasons we picked this is that the the training investigation or the effect that they're investigating on is pretty novel in itself so to look at a more novel training effect and add a different dimension to it i think is, is quite interesting that's one of the reasons we picked this you know it's always good to be investigating new things you might never use them and in most of these cases we don't ever use them i know fitz doesn't use them for his real athletes but it's very very useful to you know look at these different things see what's happening with them does it have any carryover to other things do multiple things match up and then you end, end up with a kind of a consensus you know so it may be that at one point in the next five years you might need it for one athlete and it might be very very useful so i'd always think for novel training effects like this or novel training methods it's certainly useful to look at them but then it's important never to kind of, you know, make that your whole thing and then suddenly start giving everyone PAP. So post-activation post potentiation is quite a novel effect. So then to add something like these resistance bands to it and see that it again increases the effect of that is very, very useful. Of course, for researchers, it's very, very useful for them. So they can start making inferences and really narrow down some of the reasons why PAP works. And there's a couple of different reasons for those and we maybe won't go into those now. We might do a different time. But it is a well-known phenomenon at this stage so it's just a cool little thing to look at and see what happens when you do change it up like this. So not only for, you know, coaches and uh, researchers is it interesting to see novel training effects, but in some circumstances, giving this to athletes could be a novel way of keeping 
attention and training high keeping enjoyment to training high just doing some different things at certain periods of time you know for most of us training in the gym is something we thoroughly enjoy and that's okay but for a lot of real athletes gym training is something they either have to do or they kind of thoroughly enjoy doing but there's no real particular aspect that if they might enjoy and eventually it might become incredibly boring to them so in certain circumstances it might be something to have on the kind of the back burner is something like this to add into their training to give them a little bit more of a, a, just a novel stimulus in their training the second thing with this PAP or PAP as they were calling it in this paper is right now we don't know if the long term effects of PAP have any difference compared to non PAP training. So we haven't really seen any kind of 8, 10, 12 week interventionist programs compared to one group using PAP or PAP versus a group that is doing non PAP training. So traditional strength training, plyometric training. So the obviously the short term benefits of PAP do seem to be a very realistic aspect so it seems that like it, it's been well reputed now a lot of uh, different groups under different circumstances have gotten it in certain circumstances they didn't see the PAP but a lot of groups now have seen and for a very long time that something does happen when you um, do these PAP kind of style trainings does that mean for sure that you will see a long-term increase in performance or a more meaningful increase in performance compared to non-PAP training it's not really clear yet. I would say if you go by gut feeling, you would imagine the answer is probably yes. There's a couple of problems with that though and why we haven't seen it. But eventually, if you looked at these two on paper, if you had an A session which did slightly lower results and a B session with slightly higher results, your inclination would be, well, it looks like B would probably be a better training method to go if you're seeing better results in their jumping and their sprinting. So overspeed training and facilitated jumping seem to produce more power and do seem to facilitate running very well. So... While PAP is slightly different from these, it does seem to add up with the rest of the research. So I think while it might be very useful, there's a couple of downsides with PAP training. So uh, especially PAP training resistance bands. So PAP is quite hard to facilitate. Um, it's quite hard to measure you doing anything. It's probably very fatiguing. PAP with resistance bands. So the use of resistance bands can be quite hard in people's joints in general. They can have a lot of more force, especially through, you know, your uh, lower back, for example, if you're trying to squat explosively, it's parallel. So the use of is that resistance bands can also be hard to accurately gauge how much loading you're doing. And it seems like the loading in this is very, very useful or very, very particular. So it matters how much loading, even 10% of the loading seems to matter how much is coming from the bands versus actual weights. So they had the use of a force plate, which are very, very expensive, and it's almost certain that nobody watching this has a force plate in their home gym. So it's not really practical to implement PAP training resistance bands in your home gym. But if it was something you potentially could do, it does look interesting. I would bet over the long term if you use PAP training, it probably does elicit a positive training effect and maybe slightly better. These things are very nuanced so it's quite hard to measure them. Overall though, it's something we'll be keeping an eye on. And if we encounter one or hopefully someone's working on it where they're doing a long-term investigation effect of PAP, then we'll certainly be interested in the results of that. Thanks for watching guys. Leave any um, suspicious slash algorithm comments below and really appreciate it.